Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. I think in my whole life, I've been focused on doing what I find interesting without a big plan. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we're speaking with Axel Bishara. He's the co-founder and general partner at Baukunst, a uh, venture capital firm focused on technology and design companies. In the past, Axel has been a first round lead investor, co-founder or board member at SolidWorks, Onshape, Revit, GrabCAD, SimScale, Vention, Join, Dragon Innovation, Tempo Automation, and Premise. Some big names there that a lot of you, I'm sure, recognize. Axel has been an entrepreneur, investor, and company builder his whole career. He helps founders, particularly of engineering software companies, realize their vision with capital and, more importantly, with the company building expertise he has acquired from leading investments in more than 100 companies, more than 40 private and public boards of directors, and from the creation of many billions of dollars of enterprise value. Axel also has a master's degree in engineering from MIT. Axel, thank you so much for being on the show. Aaron, thank you for inviting me. Well, how did you first get into investing? Um, I was a co-founder of a venture-backed company out of MIT called, uh, called Premise and uh, learned about the investing business uh, as entrepreneur. And uh, after we sold the company, um, came to the conclusion that this is a very interesting business that I want to pursue. And that's what I did. And this was during your time as a student at MIT or, or directly yeah, following I was, uh, that? I was still a student. Uh, we, we got uh, some very nice venture financing very, uh, very quickly while still being students. So I had to scramble to finish my degree uh, and you know, <laughs> be able to really contribute to the company worked out fine for everybody. And, um, and uh, and then got started. We we're very young. I was 23 when we uh, when we got started, and uh, it was a very very interesting journey. It was an incredibly uh, steep learning curve, and uh, met some very interesting people. And uh, learning about um, their business really on the on the receiving end led me to think, hmm, maybe after we sold the company, maybe that's what I should be doing next. And that's what I did. Fascinating. So uh, you were going to school to become an engineer. Was uh, was the intention ever to, yeah, I'll get a degree in engineering because it's going to prepare me for a lot of different things. It teaches me how to think, which is super valuable. Uh, but who knows if I'll actually be an engineer or, or, or were you like your intention was to be an engineer and just the investing VC thing just happened to come along and that seemed more interesting. I think in my whole life, I've been focused on doing what I find interesting without a big plan. <laughs> and, um, and even, even going to MIT was a little bit of an accident. I, um, so it is, um, it was really accidents of history, uh, piled on top of each other. What I know now is I would have probably never been a great passionate engineer. Um, and, um, but, but having the engineering foundation, I mean, is the best thing you can possibly have to, to, to do what I ended up doing. Oh, that's, that's a very interesting thing to say. Can you uh, speak a little bit more about that? How has a background in engineering helped you as a, a VC? Um, well, it's, it's, um, uh, well, you, you think rigorously about the world, right? Um, you obviously have great depths of technology, uh, even today, I can evaluate technologies uh, uh, pretty well. Don't don't really need to rely on others. Um, having an understanding of what it really takes to bring products to market from from an engineering standpoint, the complexity of teams, um, and uh, when hardware is involved, manif you know, ma complexity of manufacturing. The and I've had the privilege of having both engineering education in Germany and the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. Germany is very manufacturing focused. It's a very, very good, strong foundation. And, um, 
And so even today, it's, it's really a daily benefit in, uh, in, in investing, but we consider ourselves not just investors, we're really company builders. And, uh, and engineers are the leaders of the vast majority of our companies and having that, uh, depth of understanding cultural, um, relationship with other engineers and knowing what it takes is a huge advantage. Yeah. That's wonderful. Great. Well said. Well, you and I were introduced by John Hirschstick, who is the founder of SolidWorks and uh, now Onshape, the world's first and only clad cloud native CAD and PDM system. Um, John was on the show a few weeks ago and, and he suggested that you might be an interesting mm-hmm. guest. And I, I quickly uh, mm-hmm. agreed with him on that. Um, you were one of the first founders in SolidWorks. Um, when, when you met John, I'm, I'm curious, what, what are some things that John did or, or maybe didn't do that, that convinced you he was, he was worth backing? This guy, he, he's legit. Yeah. He has a good idea here. The, the history goes back even further. John and I were at MIT together. And, ah, um, okay. and even the first company we co-founded, the, um, uh, out of MIT, the one I just referred to, that was pre-SolidWorks. So after I, um, after we sold the company, and when I decided to become a venture capitalist, the alternative would, would, would have been to start another company, and it might have been SolidWorks with John. So we were already <laughs> um, in business together uh, got when, it. When, um, when, when SolidWorks got started. So um, it was, for me, knowing John as well as I already did back then, um, uh, he, I mean, he turned out to be one of the luminaries, maybe the luminary of the CAD industry in, in, uh, you know, in our generation. Yeah. And, um, and I just knew he was a very special person back then. And that's how we started that company together. And, uh, getting SolidWorks funded was not what, you know, took some effort. Me as a young new venture capitalist convincing my partners, um, took some took some work but it was i i was super happy to do it i had a lot of conviction and um and well and 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 we did it but it was really my understanding of the depths of um vision and smarts and leadership abilities and uh, caring about people that i that i saw mm-hmm. in john that that made me want to do it I imagine your ability to convince your partners back then that this was a good idea was at least partly in, uh, based in the fact that you were an engineer yourself or you had the training of an engineer and you understood the value in a way that maybe other VCs without the engineering background might not have. Yeah, it was very interesting. Um, so at the time, CAD, this is in the early ni- whatever, 90, this was in 93, uh, actually 94. Um, um, CAD was viewed by VCs as a mature industry. You know, that, that's an old play. Um, there's no more innovation. It's growing at 15% a year. Why would anybody want to invest there? And, um, and if you look at the total market cap of the industry at that time it was probably less than a billion dollars or so. And you look at, at the value and impact the industry has had since, uh, basically whoever said this is not an interesting industry got it totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so me being out of that and sticking with it and saying this is something we need to do did help. That that uh, brings to mind a story I heard a while ago. This might be um, apocryphal. I don't know. But uh, back in the early 1900s, when uh, someone who worked at the patent office said, everything has already been invented. We should just close yeah. down the patent office. There's nothing else to invent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All the number of computers that are needed in the world, uh, some quote from IBM or Bill Gates or something. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, you've been involved with uh, over a hundred companies and, and contributed to over forty boards over the years. What are one or two of the the habits or, or behaviors that you've seen the most successful companies embrace, and and uh, conversely, some of the worst habits that you've seen out there? Yeah, um, the most important thing. Um, a founder, a founding team does. And we, I've always invested at the earliest stages. So typically first money in when entrepreneurs get, uh, get started is, um, it's all about building a great, uh, team, great, uh, you know, great founding team, management team, et cetera. You're only as good as a team you're playing on. And that includes the people you hire full time, but also the people you surround yourself with, including advisors, investors, um, and, and, uh, so, quality of team building has the biggest impact on company success. Mm. Um, 
And uh, so, so getting that right, life is, as an investor, if the, if the founders get that right, uh, life is good. If they don't get it right, life is not so good. And, uh, and but part of my role is to help raise the founding team's game in in uh, in recruiting, first of all. Yeah, that, that's um, an interesting um, uh, piece of the puzzle that maybe not everyone fully appreciates. I, I don't think I have that uh, the venture capitalist is not just bringing money to the table, yeah. but expertise and, and guidance and probably introductions to, to other experts as well. Yes, we... Um, we picked the name of our firm, Baukunst, uh, it's German and stands for the art of building. And it was a very deliberate choice because we believe there's an art of building companies and we practice it. And we have a conviction that it uh, can make a huge difference in building a great foundation for a high upside uh, company. And um, now the... Um, um, not everybody views the world uh, through those lenses, uh, both investors and entrepreneurs are definitely entrepreneurs who want just want to raise money and be left alone. And they're also investors who view themselves as stock pickers. We are not stock pickers. We're company builders. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah, that helps frame it well. Um so generally speaking, when a founder approaches uh, a VC, Balkunst or any firm for funding. What 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 do you expect that founder to have prepared already? Yeah. You know, before they even start talking with you. Yeah. So um, it's less about what they've prepared, and it's more about an authentic story. And uh, often, the amount of preparation is. Um, the, the amount of preparation may actually go in the wrong direction. They want to answer all the questions, but if they get the mm. essence of what we call founder market fit wrong, all the preparation doesn't matter. And um, so we look for an authentic story of why does this founder want to do it and um, how are they thinking about the world? What are the personal motivations? And then also, are they thinking big? Do they want to you know, make a few dollars or build a great company, change the world? So really understanding the, the motivations is hugely more important than anything that's, that's prepared. So we're super happy to have a conversation with somebody who has nothing prepared um, if some of those ingredients um, are there, actually. Wonderful. Okay. And once you've heard a little bit about the, the founder's story, their idea, how do you decide whether you want to take the next step and, and potentially yeah. invest? Yeah. So the two main criteria we look at are um, founder quality, or it's really founding team quality. And uh, typically, a founding team of more than one person is better than just a single founder, but we've done plenty of single founder in investments too. And number two is really attractiveness of market opportunity. These are the two main ingredients, right? Great team, and it needs to be, we call it sometimes a good planet to land on, right? Is there money to be made in this market? Is it large? Is it growing? Is there not an overwhelming competitive landscape, um, et cetera? And, and then, um, so these are sort of the must, must have check marks. And then you, you peel layers of the onion. Is there, can this product be built? Can it be built um, in a reasonable time frame? What's a competitive landscape? Um, one, one thing we focus on very much is capital efficiency. Can you bring a product to market and establish product market fit on, um, you know, within 12 to 18 months and, um, and a couple million dollars is a hugely more attractive investment for us that's something that you need to spend, you know, five years and $50 million and maybe you have something you can bring to market. So as a relatively small fund, we look at, we look at capital efficiency, especially in the first few years of a company's life. Yeah. Okay. Great. What, what is it that you're, you're typically investing in? You talked about the team, right? So mm -hmm. it, how important is the idea versus the person versus the company that it can become? What, what is your mindset yeah. like as you're evaluating these things? Yeah. Again, t t team is by far the most important. And, and, um, but if you go back to the earlier part of the conversation, when John and I started this first company out of MIT, we were at whatever, 23 and 24 years old. It, it, it was whoever backed us at the time 
um, saw something in us that wasn't a big resume, obviously, we're just students. And um, so you need to see something special in the team. And um, we need to make the judgment call. Are these are these founders people who can just do the unnatural acts it almost takes to um, to build a great company? It is crazy hard. Um, you live 90% or 99% of the time in the first few years, you live with rejection because everybody is negative. Nobody wants to buy from you. Nobody wants to find you. Nobody wants to join your company. And so can, can, you know, can this team break through walls and, um, and, and, and just somehow make it? Um, because it's definitely not for everybody. And then, but then other questions can, let's say you make it in the first few years, you get to a few million revenues. Do they have the potential to scale from there? Hire a team, let go of, of responsibilities, scale it up from here. And um, so the whole, the, the depths of conviction we need to have on t- management teams and founding teams is, is, is actually very important. And we get it, often we get it right, but we also get it wrong regularly. And it's a, it's a batting average uh, to some degree. And, um, and, um, and we invest in the ability of that team to execute more than anything else, right? Technology, product, prototypes, demos, all good. And I, we love to see them as they're there and we love to get excited about them. But whatever you see when you invest early on is only a tiny bit of what needs to be built to build a real company. And that's where it comes back to quality of team. Yeah. Okay. You had mentioned earlier that you prefer to invest in teams that have two founders or or multiple founders Mm -hmm. versus just a single founder. Why is that? Being a founder and uh, is a very lonely job. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It can be a very lonely job because you have your, let's say you're, you're funded, you're, you're off the ground. Um, you're the CEO of the company. You are the, you have every, you are at the, um, Every problem starts and ends with you one way or another. And that's a very big burden to carry. And in my experience, most humans are better if they are in well-functioning partnerships of basically management teams where people make each other successful and um, challenge each other, have open communications. And we are actually fundamental non-believers in the Uber founder who knows everything, controls everything, the the godfather-like figure vast majority of the companies that's not the case <clears throat> there's a team and an ecosystem behind uh, behind it that that's that's uh, making huge contributions to the work so we have this saying that this is often a one plus one equals five if you get um two founders together who can who complement each other can make each other successful uh easier to maneuver through difficult situations um easier to raise each other's games uh, we play the role of being coaches for these founders. But even as an active investor, a board member, you only spend so much time. If you have a, a mutual coach or mutual coaching with a team that's spending 60 hours a week together, it's just a better way. It's a better way to do it. So um, now we have plenty of success stories with where we back single founders, but then often the, the immediate task becomes to add to the team it doesn't not not necessarily finding a co-founder like person, but um, adding people who can raise that founder's game in the in the day in the day to day of running the business. Yeah, I I really appreciate what you're saying there. I started Pipeline in 2009, so we're coming up on 14 years now, mm-hmm. and it's it's a, a long, mm-hmm. lonely slog putting mm-hmm. together a, a new company from scratch. I joined a. Uh, a group called Entrepreneurs Organization um, and did that for several years. I was also part mm. of another organization called Strategic Coach for a few years. And I think the one of the biggest benefits to me, they they taught me about business. That was helpful mm. for sure. But but just being around a group of other business owners and entrepreneurs, you know, who who were going through the same struggles and and understood what it meant to start a company and, and lead the company, that was hugely beneficial for me. Yes, we are huge believers in that and uh, plugging founders into our ecosystem, into our network is a huge part of what we do. Um, but, but, the, um, but the network only goes so far. Having um, 
a lead investor board member who really cares and has experience. I mean, it's uh, it's what we do, but we, we have, we're, we're total believers in that. But then also having it on the team every day around the clock is, um, is uh, we, we believe that enterprise value gets mostly built by the full-time entrepreneurially committed team. And, um, and, and that's where getting this right early on is, uh, is, is so important. And also having, adding team members who are strong enough to, to be a real uh, part of the leadership and challenge the founders and, uh, and, and, and raise, each, uh, raise each other's game is a, is a term we use. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what are a few maybe changes or, or differences that founders should expect uh, when building their business with an investment partner hmm. versus just, you know, bootstrapping it on their own. You know, if, yeah. if, I've, if I've just accepted funding, like w what should I be expecting from my VC partner? Yeah. Um, so the biggest, um, the biggest um, misperception or often um, raising money is, um, triggered by, well, we need capital to build the product or sell it or, or, or whatever. Um, but, and then, and then there's almost a fork in the road, right? Do you get investors who just provide the money and leave you alone? Or do you get an investor who actually actively gets involved and contributes to company building? And the different paths, right? And the analogy we sometimes use is you are, a tennis player or a soccer team or football team, do you want to play with a coach or without a coach, right? The uh, just raise money and leave me alone, alone is you play without a coach. You um, you get an experienced company builder as a lead investor and board member, you have a coach. And our view is that the best of the best tennis players, football players, soccer players have coaches. And that's what we do. And so if you want to be the best of the best, you probably want a, a good coach. I, I love that explanation. Um, I have certainly found that to be true in my own career. Mm -hmm. I've had sales coaches. I've had business coaches. Uh, I was part of those two uh, business coaching groups mm -hmm. as well. And they've just been tremendously helpful, you mm -hmm. know. Um, yeah. High-performing athletes have coaches, so wh why wouldn't yeah. we have coaches in business yeah, as well? Yeah, that is, that is something we ask. But there are some very important uh, rules also in how you coach. Um the, the probably rule number one is we as investors and board members are there to make the founders and the management team successful. We may have different opinions actually. And, um, but in the end, we maybe state those opinions, try to, um, try to convince founders, well, this would be a good idea. This may be not such a good idea. But in the end, we don't decide. We provide options, ask questions, provide information. But then get out of the way, let the founding team decide, and then back them up, even if we don't agree with the uh, with the decision necessarily, partly because it's never black and white. They may be right, we may be wrong, and um, and somebody needs to decide and own the decision, and that must be the founders. It cannot possibly be the investors. And so um, now when investors violate that rule, and it happens regularly, it it's the beginning of a huge mess <laughs> because you end up mm. with backseat driving of the company. And if you ever have found it saying, well, I don't really want to do this, but I kind of have to for my investors, there's something very broken. And it's part of our jobs to build relationships and also behave and how we work with the companies to not end up there. That is uh, a very refreshing to hear and, and frankly, kind of surprising. Um, I had always assumed that if you bring a VC on, well, uh, your freedom is over, right? You're going to be controlled by the VC. Uh, I, I just watched this Netflix series, We Crashed, the, the, the mm -hmm. WeWork story with mm -hmm. Adam uh, Newsom, I think, Newman Newsom, I can't remember now, but... Anyway, uh, that story was so interesting to me of how this founder of, of WeWork built the company and... He, he, they were never profitable under under his leadership, and he was making arguably some questionable decisions throughout the yeah. the many years that he was bringing in billions of dollars of funding. And yeah. one of the things I, I found so interesting was there were scenes in this this series where the the VC team would speak with Adam, the founder, and and they would make suggestions, but they would explicitly say, "This is your call." 
you need to make this decision. And I thought, wow, what, what a, um, I guess a paradigm shift. I, I always thought the VC is the one who really controls things, but maybe that's just not how it is. Um, it is not how it should be. Sometimes that's what people do, but a good experienced investor will not, will, will not do that. Even if it's, even if it's a fairly dysfunctional, uh, situation because, uh, they're not there every day uh, that you then as in my job need to do the best you can to support the founding team or the, the you know leadership of the company and um but but trying to micromanage it leads generally leads to failure mm, yeah very interesting yeah. Well, when you're trying to determine the the value of a company, is there uh, a, a quick, simple rule of thumb? Just you know, uh, in the beginning, of course, I'm sure there's lots of due diligence that goes into this number later on. But in the beginning, is there a quick rule of thumb for for how to value a company? Um, it's mostly based on experience and and general market conditions um, and. It's fairly arbitrary, actually. Um, and, uh, there's also a, a question of, you know, this is, is this, um, fashionable area to invest in or not so fashionable area to invest in? And it's definitely not an efficient market where it's like a car, you know, it's in a fairly, fairly narrow range. Uh, there's a wide range of, um, uh, of, of valuations you can come up with for a given company, especially early on. Um, and uh, but if you live in those markets every day, you meet companies, you have conversations. How excited are you about it? Investors will develop an opinion about what they're willing to pay, and then there's a negotiation component. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And somebody, one person may see a higher potential value than another one. Um, but it's also multi-dimensional game reputation of investor quality of investor quality of board member is the other dimensions other than just valuation um there are also terms there may may be less uh there may be a higher valuation but less attractive terms from one investor versus another yeah well i'm, I'm sure that there are plenty of frustrations mm. for the, the vcs when mm. they're dealing with founders um looking at it from the opposite end what are some frustrations that that maybe founders um, sometimes have with with their VC partners. Oh yeah, I have a lot of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the uh, a few come to mind. One is um, the VC just doesn't care and doesn't spend the time and is hard to reach and uh, is uh, we used to call you know the speakerphone board member, not 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 the person mm. actually comes. To, it's a little different with Zoom now, but. Um, I, um, um, I think there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, there's an, um, there's an, um, there's a social contract, almost implied social contract when you invest that so you'll be there to, to help build that company, not just, not just fair weather sailing, but especially when it gets difficult. And, um, and a lot of VCs, it comes back to the, uh, you know, to the are more stock pickers. So they buy the stock and kind of see what happens. They don't, they don't try to improve the value of the stock necessarily. So it's a, it's a business you, i I believe the longer you do it, you always get better at it. I think every year I'm still getting, getting better at it. Of course. Yeah. 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 Always making progress. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what level of return do you look for when making an investment and, and how long, you know, is that like a, a you want, yeah. you want your return in a year or two years or five years? Um, so we, um, like most early stage venture firms have, uh, funds that have a t initial lifetime of 10 years with extensions. Um, realistically, um, even 10 years after you start a fund, even 15 years after you start a fund, you're still likely to have some of the often best portfolio companies in there. So it's fairly long-term oriented, especially, um, especially if you're an early stage investor, uh, because it takes so long to get that initial product bill, product market fit, scaling. And uh, there are very few companies that end up being a perfect hockey stick. It's a much more it goes up, down, up, down. And on average, hopefully it goes up quite a bit. Um, um, so quite long time constants and, um, uh, the return expectations are, are that every investment we make, we have a goal that if the stars line up, if things go great, we return our whole fund on that investment. So it's a hundred million dollar mm. fund. Um, 
if we invest a few million dollars in the company and things really work out 10 years later, that initial investment is worth a hundred million. That's, that's, that's our, that's our goal. And in every fund we, in, in, in most funds that, uh, that, 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 that we do, we actually have a few companies which achieve that. And then you have a, then you have a great fund. Yeah, that's wonderful. What I'm sure that this varies widely, so that there might not be uh, an easy answer or maybe any answer mm-hmm. for this, but um, is, is there a, a rule of thumb that uh, a founder can keep in mind for how much of the company do they give up in terms yeah. of, you know, profit revenue once a VC comes in? Yeah. Well, they give up equity, right? Um, equity, and uh, yeah. yeah. And, um, so yes, there are good rules for, um, for pre-seed round, seed round, A round, et cetera. Um, and, um, uh, yes, they exist. And we, when we make an investment, we need to, we need to just make sure it's all, um, that the capital structure looks reasonable post investment also for the next investor, because if it's out of whack, uh, it makes the company less attractive for follow on investment. So, um, th- those rules exist. It would probably be too much to get into them, into them right now. Um, and, um, there are also ways to fix capital structures later. One of the classic one is, a departed co-founder who owns a whole bunch, who's not contributing anymore. We, we call it dead weight on a cap table. Um, that's not good and needs to be, you know, often needs to be addressed. Um, if the VCs own too much is a problem, but if they own too little, it's also a problem because if you have, uh, let's say, you know, you raise a few million dollars, you have three or four small investors. They each own two or three percent. Nobody cares if anything goes sideways, right? You need mm. your investors to care and, yeah. and, and, and be there to, uh, to help. But if you have so little ownership that has no impact on the fund, people will just disappear the moment it gets difficult. Yeah. No skin in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. What do companies who accept investment funding, uh, often look like? Are, are they, you know, just brand new starting off, uh, or, or are they maybe established teams that they already have something put together and they're just looking to scale or is it all of the above? It's all of the above. We sometimes have, um, a single founder. I mean, the extreme is a single founder with an idea. I want to do something. That's the extreme. Um, and we've done this a whole bunch of times with, with, uh, with success. Um, there is maybe at the other end of the spectrum, um, a team which has worked together for a few years has been kind of stumbling along and are now finally getting it right. Um, there are also situations where people have started as a services business, want to productize it now. That's often a difficult transition to make, but, um, but that sometimes happens. Uh, we sometimes see, uh, prototypes, um, whether it's hardware, software, we, um, we, uh, often see customers. We sometimes see customers, especially if it's software only, it's pretty easy to get some initial customers, users. Um, um, so it's actually a very wide spectrum. Um, what we typically look for is to be the first significant professional investor, um, and we look for an entrepreneur who looks for somebody who plays that role to help build the foundation for something that can be big. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about some, some red flags that you've seen working with founders in your career? Yeah. Um, probably the, the biggest red flag is, um, not willing, not being willing to listen and learn. And it relates to the coaching, actually. Um, nobody knows everything, especially in tech. It's so hard. You need to be humble, willing to listen, ask questions, be willing to, you know, and uh, be willing to entertain that you're wrong when somebody asks a question and be open-minded. And the know it all, leave me alone, get out of my way attitude is, um, is a huge red flag. And it is not because, oh, we think we know it and, and the founder doesn't. It is if you behave that way, you're just not open to coaching. You will not build a team with where people challenge each other and have the right level of respect to raise each other's game. And, um, and, but interestingly in, in 
how founders in our society often get glorified as the uber founder who knows everything. It's almost the, the you know, the popular image of founders is actually exactly the opposite of what works. <laughs> and, um, oh, interesting. and it's kind of ironic. So the, you know, the, hum the humble, well listening founders. Were, so if, if we don't, if we don't see that, or if we start to get, poor communication, not being open to questions. That's a, that's a huge red flag, both post, both pre and post investment, obviously pre investment, we don't invest, but we sometimes get it wrong and it happens post investment and trying to fix that is important. Uh, and it may or may not work, but it's then it's our problem that we need to improve the communication, make sure, uh, trust gets built if that was lost somehow. Uh, trust is a very important thing. We, uh, as an investor, you, you know, the founders need to trust the investors. Uh, by the way, we love founders who do reference checks on us before we invest. We certainly <laughs> do reference checks on the founders. You can't fire your investors. It's one of my, one of my sayings. So better do reference checks uh, on them. And, um, and, um, so, It's part of my job to make sure that open, honest communication and collaboration is there and, um, and, and that it doesn't, it doesn't, and if it gets lost, try to, try to rekindle, uh, try to rekindle yeah. it. Um, other things are, um, being driven by money ownership valuation instead of, um, accomplishing things for customers, for the world, for, um, for, um, you know, for what they set out to do originally. Um, that, that's typically a red flag when it's more about how much money do I make as a founder versus how do I build a truly great company? The best way to build it, make a lot of money is to build a truly great company, generally speaking. Um, also being uh, wasteful with capital is, is one that's a red flag when people, oh, I just raised a big round, high valuation. And you just start uh, spending it inefficiently is, um, is, is, is very unfortunate uh, because having a lot of money basically often brings bad habits. Mm. Does it, have you found that it brings new bad habits or exacerbates existing bad habits? Um, we've actually seen both. We've seen founders who were, um, who already had the bad habit and, uh, And well, now it's, now it's getting, getting worse. Now, when we invest early on, we try to not let these bad habits get too established. Um, yeah. but again, we don't control things. We try, we just try to bring our perspective to the table, but we've definitely seen founders uh, being very frugal and then raise a lot of money and then, and then being, and actually sometimes it's driven by the later stage investors who say, well, you've got to hire the sales team, you know, be incredibly aggressive. And so it's not just the founders themselves. It's also the environment they end up mm. with. And so even follow on investors being uh, capital efficient is something we, we look for, but um, uh, so yes, you, we've, we've definitely seen that go sideways in later stages of the company. Now, sometimes you actually do need to ramp up the burn quite a bit to just play to win in a market or if you have figured out the arbitrage of customer acquisition relative to lifetime value, you just want to put fuel on the fire because you're making money, you have a profitable business. Uh, and But finding the right balance between doing that right and wrong is tricky. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that pre-investment, a red flag and post-investment, both a red flag you see as founders not being willing to, to listen to their uh, VC partners, not being open-minded. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to, to pre-investment, are there, are there other mistakes that, that you commonly see founders making when seeking that investment capital? Um. Sometimes uh, founders want to come with a more complete team and, but don't quite get the team right. So we prefer a founding team of, let's say, two people who are really good to one with five people that's quote complete. Mm. Um, okay. But it's really, it's really, it's really not that good. It's also pre pretending of yeah pretending or, or representing to know things that you don't know yet mm. um in terms of operating plans 
profitability um, and you know or, or, or time to market in um, in bring a product to market. It's totally okay to say um, I don't know. I don't know the answer, but uh, here here are the metrics to watch. Here here's how I plan to mitigate. Uh, you know, things take longer, things go sideways, and so the the process and getting we we call it getting into the founders' heads, understanding how they think, uh, is is much more important than the result that comes out at the um, at, at at the other end. Right, the the operating plan of the company for the next eighteen months is something we always work on. But how you got there is actually the interesting part. What thoughts went into how quickly you hire, how you build that product, how quickly you bring it to which market segment, how quickly you scale that. And, um, and, uh, so anyway, that may give you a little bit of a, of a, of yeah. a sense. No. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, just maybe one or two more questions here and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Um, what expectations should founders be aware of that an investment partner, um, will have of that founder? It's very important to have, um, an agreement about what, um, what, what is everybody going for in, in building a company, right? And having a mismatch of expectation of what people want to go for. And it's a little bit the underlying expectation, uh, the underlying motivation for building the, uh, building the company. It's very important to have an explicit conversation. And when we have a sense that somebody doesn't have the, you know, dream of conquering the world and will actually go for it, we probably shouldn't invest. But also a founder who raises venture money, which, and, and, and brings people like us in who have the ambition to build a, great big company they they just the advice you give for somebody who's shooting for a 50 100 million dollar exit is different from a billion dollar exit and so there needs to be a match in objectives uh, very very important the um open and honest communication a lot of things go things go sideways every day <laughs> when you when you start a company and we know that and um and being open about it, communicating well, asking for help, um, going in with, with the expectation that there's an experienced person who cares uh, to help with those problems. That's that's the expectation you you would have of a good investor. Also, always being available. You know, somebody, mm, yeah. one of my companies calls any time of day, weekend, uh, and there's a problem, you need, to, you need to be there. It's totally an expectation. Oh, wait, that's the expectation of the founders. But actually, it goes the other way around too, right? If something goes sideways, the founders need to be there. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, Axel, that was so interesting. I really did not know much at all about the, the mm. VC world. So this was fascinating for me. And, and I'm sure there are a lot of engineering uh, founders to be out there listening to this that uh, find this just hugely valuable information. So thank you so much for, for sharing all this. Um, uh, it, if there are founders out there listening to this thinking, wow, uh, this guy, uh, Axel and, and his firm, Baukunz, that sounds perfect for me. How, how can they get in touch with you? Um, they can email me. It's Axel, A-X-E-L at Baukunst.co. So, ba and that's B-A-U-K-U-N-S-T. Dot C-O. Yeah. Dot C-O. Correct. Great. Okay. Well, wonderful. Again, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, what a, what a interesting and delightful conversation that has been. Thank you, Axel. Aaron, thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.